Thank you all for, for coming. Just a very short background. This is part of a celebration of the 100th year, 100th anniversary of Rabat al Qalamiya, which is the which is a, a, the formation of a group of uh, writers, poets, and artists in, in New York in 1920. And this meeting is meant to follow up. So 100 years ago, we had, we had artists and we had uh, uh, writers and actors. What do we have now from the Middle East? What's the Middle Eastern contribution? What's the continuous Middle Eastern contribution to New York? to the cultural scene in New York, to the artistic scene, the theater, music, dance, with Rawia here. To, so, every, so it's just a conversation to basically catch up on, on everything. So Hadi will talk mainly, will give us a short introduction on music, on, on the music scene. Uh, and I, I'm not going to try and introduce anybody because they will introduce, part of the story is what, that you introduce your New York story, that you talk, tell us your New York story and how you, you, how you became a superstar like Hadi Tabal, who's going to also t tell us his story. And uh, so, and we, we all, we, so we also have Malik, Malik Najjar, who will give us a bit of background, the historical background. And Catherine will tell us uh, about the theater scene. Uh, she's involved with uh, NYU North Theater with uh, a, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, or, uh, institutions uh, in 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 New, in New York. So uh, another thing is that we're very happy to be sponsored by Humanities New York, who have been very supportive of the project and. Basically, this was supposed to be physical meetings, networking meetings in our building in, in uh, Manhattan with uh, seminars and workshops and all that before the COVID crisis happened. But we're going to go back to that, uh, hopefully after that. So, so Humanity New York, thank you. And thank you for the National Endowment for Humanities who is sponsoring the program with Humanity New York. This uh, Nadim Henri yes. Zreb says that he can't see you. It seems he has a problem. I don't know why. He wrote in the chat. Okay. Henri <laughs> Lema He can't see me. Okay. I can't see him either. Okay. Uh, Hadi will send him an. And I, there's, there was just an email from Dina. Anyway, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so the other thing, the other, I, I wanted to also mention that originally we started this centenary celebration with several institutions. One of them is the Khairallah Center in North Carolina for Lebanese Immigration Studies, which is an amazing institution. They have fantastic archives and collections, and the Washington Street Historical Society, which is really reviving the history of the Lebanese and Syrian communities in downtown Manhattan. Linda Jacobs, the historian of us all, and the Arab American National Museum uh, in, De in Detroit, who incidentally are having an event themselves on the 17th, uh, celebrating also the the uh, um, centenary of, 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 of the Rabita. So that's enough from me. And Malik, do you want to tell us why we're here? <laughs> I would love to. Um, my name is Malik Najjar. I'm a uh, professor at the University of Oregon. And um, my connection to New York is that my Jiddu Hassan uh, came through New York uh, with his wife, and my father, Jamil, came through New York uh, when he immigrated. So uh, I, that's, that's my deep connection to New York and little Syria. And I've been asked to talk about the history uh, about Rabat al-Qalamiyya, which I'll do briefly. Um, and Rabat al-Qalamiyya, or the Pen League, the Pen Bond, as it's often called, the Mahjar School, 
um, was an extraordinary gathering of Syrian Americans who during the Arab Renaissance or Al Nahda came together during two specific periods with the goal to rejuvenate the Arabic language, to establish a connection between the Arabic language and the Arab people, and to create a writer's union that would work to promote the rights of its members to demand compensation for their work. The first group was organized in May of 1916 and comprised of the following members. And I, I hope you don't mind my listing these uh, members because they really were the forefathers, if you will. Amin al-Rahani, Elias Atalla, Rashid Ayyub, Nasib Arida, Wadi Bahut, William Kaziflis, Jibran Khalil Jibran, who served as the president, Abdul Nasih Haddad, Nadra Haddad, and Amin Mushriq. And they wrote that, quote, the pen bond is here to create a bond among writers which will make them one heart and of one vision with a purpose to protect what little is left of the Arabic language and nurture it with innovation, cleansed of the useless, to strengthen the status of writers of every denomination and class, and to establish a real connection between the Arabic language and the Arab people, unquote. Membership was by invitation, and residing in New York City seemed to be a condition of the membership for the bond. Amin Mushriq's fiery manifesto, written when he was 18 years old, I might remind all of you, stated, quote, yes, the pen bond will sift through this group that is assaulting literature and get rid of them forever. It will select from the field of the Arab people, the plants and bushes that are ready to grow and are fit for life and will nurture them by including them within the pen bond where they will be fed delicious food and given pure water. In this way, it will form for the Arabic language a strong devoted army that will protect it from the attacks of foreign languages and the attacks of our excellent writers and poets, in quotes, and establish for a writer, the writers a league that will gather them under its wings and turn their trampled rights into sacred rights that no hostile foreign hands will ever touch. A day, God willing, not far off, will come when the Arab world will see the dazzling result of this slow, quiet process. Nothing is impossible for God, unquote. Unfortunately, the first incarnation of the group was short-lived, lasting from May 1916 to September 1916. The group disbanded due to interpersonal conflicts, a dis disagreement over how Syria should be assisted by greater powers, a conflict over the formation of a writer's union by some of the members. Amin Mushrik believed it was the duty of great powers to protect weaker countries. And Naimi believed that great powers had no business in the affairs of weaker countries and should leave them alone. Gradually, the group disbanded when Mushrik emigrated to Ecuador and other members disliked another writer named Najib Dieb and his influence on the group. The second and more longer incarnation of the group, which lasted from 1920 to 1931, had a similar focus of rejuvenating the Arabic language, but also had a goal of creating and strengthening a writer's union that would promote the rights of its members to use the Arabic language as they saw fit and to have more compensation for their work. The second incarnation of the group did not include Amin al-Rehani, but Gibran was elected chairman and Mikhail Naimi was the secretary. And behind me, you can see a picture of the second group, Nasib Arida, Khalil Gibran, Abdul Masih Haddad, and Mikhail Naimi sitting together in the pen group. Still, philosophical differences remained. Nasib Arida wanted a purely literary union to avoid the political bickering and posturing, whereas Abdul Masih Haddad wanted a more journalistic union that was akin to American and European journalism and mirrored the forward thinking spirit of the nations they represented. Um, they were rarely given enough compensation by the, the major Arab American newspapers for their work, so they couldn't sustain themselves. Ultimately, however, the writers were disgusted by the Turkish influence in the Arab world that they believed led to a decline in the Arabic language and a Turkish desire to loosen the linguistic bonds that connected the sectarian groups in greater Syria. They also believed that the weakening of the Arabic language led to a weakening of the Arab spirit, which further kept the Arabs beneath the Turkish yoke. The League threw a special dinner in Gibran's honor before his 46th birthday on January 5, 1929, and many of the members were in attendance. The League disbanded after Gibran's death in 1931, 
and Mikhail Naimi's return to Lebanon in 1932. So that's just a brief history of these amazing individuals that came together and gave us the Rabat al-Qalamiya, which is a, a great hallmark in our Arab American literary history. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, and uh, Malik has a book which uh, talks about the history of the Rabita and the history of, of, of the, the, the Arabic theater in the United States up till almost up till now, right? Until the book was. Yes, it's, yeah. it traces the Arab American theater from the Arabita to the current uh, writers like Heather Raffo and Yusuf El Gundi and Betty Shamia and others. But let's not forget that uh, Jibran Khalil Jibran, Amin Rehani, and Mikhail Naimi were all playwrights also. And I think that's something that's always. Um, overlooked in our history. And I think we should really be proud of the fact that they were playwrights. And they were dealing with the same issues many of our playwrights deal with today, not having the ability to produce their plays on stages, not getting the kind of attention that other writers get. So I see a, a very clear uh, line between what happened with these early writers and what's happening with our writers today. And so uh, there's a lot of work still to be done. So this brings us to Catherine. Catherine, yeah. what's happening? Hello, hello everybody. And um, I just want to shout out um, the book uh, that Malik has coming out very soon on um, Middle Eastern American theater. It is comprehensive, it is entertaining, and you know, it is a, a must read. It absolutely is terrific. I, I, I read it already. Oh. Um, Thank you, Kevin. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit, I do work in two areas, but related, uh, which is to say that I have been long involved in international work translated and presented in New York or having U.S. playwrights translated and presented elsewhere. I'm going to turn off my video sometimes, that helps. I, I'm freezing up, I think. Um, Malik, say the name of your book. The book that's upcoming is called Middle Eastern American Theater, Communities, Cultures, and Artists. And it'll be published by Bloomsbury next year. Yeah, wonderful, super. Um, and anyway, um, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that um, my family came through New York as well. Um, my grandfather brought his family to the United States in the 19, in about 1940 actually. And uh, Ellis Island was still active and my name got messed up. Uh, it is actually Khuri and, uh, and uh, but anyway, um, that's, the, that's my New York story. I was born here. Um, so, you know, uh, Hadi Tabal likes to say I'm a blend of the Bronx and Beirut. Um, yeah. anyway, um, I was inspired by the work of my friends who created a collective called Nibras back in 2006. Um, they created a, a two-day convening that I hosted at NYU, and it suddenly made me realize that I wanted to focus more and more on work from um, my culture of origin, and um, and that was that was an, an important revelation for me. So, um, moving forward, I began to engage in ways through the university um, of supporting those kinds of exchanges and engaging my colleagues and friends here um, in New York, particularly actors and directors, to work on plays that get, that actually came from the Arab region and thus bringing um, us together with people who are our counterpart. You know, the, the, the growth of uh, Arab theater in New York has been slowly burgeoning. It's just been uh, quite a journey. And um, in 2010, uh, the uh, Noor Theater was created by Lamis Isak Mahachalawi and Nancy Vitali. Uh, so they've been around for 10 years and they won the Off-Broadway, the Obie Award. Um, they're really, it's a remarkable theater. Uh, the only one that is specifically focused on work uh, about the Middle East, from the Middle East, by Middle Eastern American writers. 
Um, I want to shout out to The Lark, which is a play development center that I've been associated with for a very long time, uh, because The Lark has been incredibly supportive to the Middle Eastern American theater community, hosting convenings that I helped to put together of artists from all over the country who identify as Middle Eastern American. Um, those gatherings have been important, not only because of the conversations that took place, but because of the um, sharing of certain um, uh, plays and you know, narratives that people were, not, people were not seeing themselves reflected in the US theater. So to suddenly now be presented by all these amazing stories told for the stage by, by Arab and Middle Eastern American writers, got, it, it's very exciting. Um, this effort of bringing people together uh, led to a convening in 2016 at the Lark that was the largest to that point. It was about um, 80 people were involved. Malik was there. And um, it included performances and conversations, really good food, you know. And, uh, and, and it, it inspired, I think, the next steps in the gatherings that have taken place the largest, I think, and most significant happened in San Francisco last fall uh, at Golden, hosted by Golden Thread Theater in their Reorient Festival. And I guess what made it exciting was that um, more people from around the country, it was really Pan-American, uh, were able to uh, gather in San Francisco and the conversations that happened led to the formation of a coalition called the Middle East North Africa Theater Makers Alliance, uh, of which Malik and I are part. And uh, in fact, we are on the steering committee for that organization. And we're hoping that it will lead to more awareness, better representation in the theater uh, of, uh, of Middle Eastern and Arab voices. Um, we're working on that now. It's very active. Um, but briefly, I just also wanted to mention that my passion for bringing people together from both sides of the world, either here or over there, continues. And uh, I would just mention, for example, the project that I began in 2016 called Arab Voices, uh, which had a, a marvelous uh, event in Beirut in 2018 um, that brought together Palestinian and Lebanese actors and directors with uh, uh, Middle Eastern American writers and directors. The work was presented in English and in Arabic, and uh, it was maybe the first event of that kind, uh, theater event, in which um, the conversations and the performances happened in both languages. We were very proud of that project. I wanted to mention that th there are a number of outstanding Arab American playwrights who are currently working in New York. And I'm going to shout out two in particular right now, and that's um, Sylvia Khouri and Mona Mansour. And partly I'm shouting them out because they both were scheduled to have premieres of their plays at leading off Broadway theaters, the Public Theater and Playwrights Horizons, this past spring. Needless to say, um, those performances were postponed, they were put aside, and, you know, inshallah, it will all happen next spring. Uh, Sylvia's play is called Selling Kabul. It's very powerful. Um, and Muna's play, The Vagrant, which stars our friend Habib Kabal, um, it is a trilogy of stories about uh, a family, a Palestinian family. And I, 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 I ask that you keep that on your radar because uh, those performances are going to happen, both the public theater and Playwrights Horizons are dedicated to making the productions happen. Um, and I guess, you know, lastly, I would just say that um, in general, we are always looking for ways to um, help provide relief for our friends and families in Lebanon right now, uh, and also moving forward. Um, uh, supporting uh, families who have lost their homes, students who cannot pay their tuition because of the economic situation, artists who have lost their performance spaces. So I urge you to go online and find out how you might uh, support. Uh, at, you know, you, there are so many different organizations, beginning with the Lebanese Red Cross, uh, 
that are reliable and uh, will make sure that that money goes in the direction you want it to. And I guess that's all I'll say for now. Thank you, thank you Catherine. Thank, uh, Hadi, um, tell, us, tell us your New York story and tell us more about the vagrant. We, we, had a read, we were very lucky, we had a reading of the vagrant just before the, the closure and I still kick myself that we didn't video it because it was going to just come to the so, um, Hadi, your, um, tell us your New York story on how you, you made it to the Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm in Brooklyn, and it's lovely to see your faces or hear your voices. Um, uh, thank you, Catherine, for mentioning the Vagrant Trilogy. Uh, uh, that is true. Mona wrote a wonderful uh, three-part play called The Vagrant Trilogy, or three plays, shall I say, um, about a Palestinian scholar who goes to London in the 1967 war, uh, in June, when the 1967 war breaks out. Uh, back in Palestine, and he has to make a very difficult decision of whether he has to go back or stay in London with his wife and their newlywed. And that's the end of the first play. And the second play is an imagination of him having stayed in London and is now teaching in, um, in, in London in the 80s during the IRA bombings and whatever parallels that brings with the Palestinian uh, struggle. And, uh, and the third play is a reimagination that he actually went back and now he's in the 60s and he is in a Palestinian camp with a family. Uh, it's, a, it's a saga, it's like four hours and we were, you know, we had three more days to open and then this pandemic hit. So um, we have not been canceled, we are still going to do it, but we're just waiting to see when people can actually sit next to each other in a relatively small theater, which is actually good news for off-Broadway venues because, you know, a theater of 150 people is not the same kind of gathering as a theater of 2,000 people on Broadway. So, um, but anyway, um, and I was playing Adham, the lead in all three, which is a monumental role, and I'm super grateful uh, for it. Uh, I'm from Lebanon. I've been Lebanese American for a year uh, because that's when I got naturalized. So I'm born and raised in Beirut. I studied at AUB. Uh, and then I got a Fulbright scholarship to come here, um, which as some of you know, is kind of a prestigious thing and they had just relaunched it and I was very lucky to get it for an acting program. Uh, because as my experience has shown lately, after years of doing this, sometimes I feel like every time there's a grant, it's like, I struggle to find the language that would be applicable for like, a writer or like, a, you know, a dancer. It's always like, how are you going to increase, incre what are the metrics you're gonna increase the community? And it's like, okay, not everyone's giving a workshop in tech in a, you know, in a camp. Like I wanna do a play, how can I fill this application? So I'm really grateful I got that Fulbright scholarship to study acting. So, um, so anyway, I did my master's in New York at the new school. Um, and then uh, I had to go back to Lebanon because uh, the rules of the scholarship uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 require you to, to give back to your home country, which is actually true. I taught there. I worked a bit in TV development. Uh, and then I started writing a bit. And then I came back to the States, which is where I wanted to really pursue a career. And I am I'm an actor and I am a writer. Um, as an actor, I, I do theater. I'm involved with institutions like The Lark. I'm involved with Catherine's work, who's been supportive to a lot of people around her. Um, and, um, and, you know, with institutions like the public and the Atlantic and all these, you know, places where you develop work at. Uh, and then um, when I came back to the, to the States, maybe I should mention this, I didn't know anyone in the Middle Eastern community. I did not even know what newer theater was. That was in 2010. And I actually just auditioned for Mona's play, uh, part one, which took place 10 years ago. And I got the part and through that, I got to know a lot of people. So it kind of happened the other way around. Actually, when I, when I auditioned, it was like, we don't know this person. Usually when you audition an Arab world, especially 10 years ago, you know everyone coming in to audition. So, um, so it was kind of the other way around. Uh, and ever since I've been lucky, uh, I've, been, you know, I've been doing more television lately, uh, uh, which ranges from like, interesting things to not very interesting things. Uh, TV is a huge wide world. 
and um, and uh, I have a few plays in development which Catherine has supported and which I've done a few readings with the law for uh, with the Lark and with New York Theatre Work with uh, sorry with um, uh, um, um, with Noor and basically. Uh, it's exciting to be writing also for television where I'm developing a new show. So I think in, at this time, this time today is to link it back to the Rabita situation. I think the hyphenated artist has become more and more important, especially for people who, are, who come from kind of voices that are deemed as underrepresented in, in, in the community. You end up writing and directing and acting and doing a lot of that stuff at the same time. And um, I know Hadi a little bit you know, had you number two, is, um, is, has, has, has several hats that he wears beautifully and wonderfully. And, you know, Catherine does a lot. So, and Zane, who we'll talk to. So, um, so yeah, it's interesting to be, I don't think this hyphenation would have worked 10 years ago or more because I think, you know, there was less of a, a recent community generating work in a kind of, in, in, a, in a comprehensive way which reminds me to mention that I'm also part of the Middle Eastern Writers Group, which was created in consultation with Catherine and which is hosted by The Lark. And we're a bunch of writers. We just meet on a weekly or monthly basis and share work. Uh, and so that also creates a certain uh, kind of a inside out, if you want, mechanism to generate work and not outside in where you're only being, you're waiting to be let into the room. That's it. Let me switch back. Ah, okay. I'm still, my sound is on. So, uh, Hadi number one, Hadi Deba, sorry, did you say you were number one? Did you think you were number one for us? Hadi Deba is number one. <laughs> Hadi Deba is number one. <laughs> because he's our partner and he's been, been doing all these wonderful workshops. Really amazing. I mean, it's, you should you should you should just go on the web 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 page and see the variety of workshops that circle of world arts have done with hadi and his team uh, we are very honored to be part of to, to have played a small part in it it was it started at at lau they were physical workshops and but also hadi will tell us more about the music scene and the entrepreneurial scene and a, a lot of uh, stuff happening in New York. When did you come here? Thank you, Nadim. I, I came here 15 years ago. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and thank you, LAU, for making this happen. This is such a wonderful initiative. I moved to the States, as mentioned, 15 years ago. I had um, a common story, really. I came here to, to look for a better future, and I pursued my degrees in, uh, in math and in chemistry. I was planning to go to medical school. But uh, due to a serendipitous event, I, um, I was directed in the direction and the path of music. I met Simon Shaheen, a Palestinian oud player, and really, um, one of the highest authorities on Arabic music, on classical Arabic music today. Um, I met him at a concert and after speaking to him post his show, we realized he, we lived only one block away from each other. We, uh, I asked for a meeting, we met together and I told him I'm interested in continuing my uh, music studies with him and he was very open to it because I have started learning the Oud and Arabic music in Lebanon at the Lebanese Conservatory. So that was the, the first uh, step uh, for me uh, in, in my music career. Moving forward, I was lucky to join uh, Bassam Saba's New York Arabic Orchestra. And there I met this wonderful musician, Mike Block, um, you know, an American cellist who graduated from Juilliard, who was interested in learning about the Arabic culture. So he came to the orchestra and we bonded together. And we're still friends till today. This I'm talking probably 10, 12 years ago. And I will teach him Fogen Nachel. He will teach me Candy Girl. And we will play that folk music. And we had that kind of beautiful exchange. That led us to, um, 
basically led me to join Yo-Yo Ma Silk Road Ensemble. I joined as a teaching artist. I was about around 20 years old and I started to teach um, at schools about Arabic culture through music, through dance. Um, from there, I continued to work with the Silk Road. I uh, started to teach at Harvard Graduate School of Education about uh, education, about the world arts. And then I started my band, the Brooklyn Nomads, which also had this world arts vibe, world music vibe, but it's rooted always in Arabic uh, and North African traditions. Then moving forward, I traveled to China. I organized a workshop. I came up with my brother with the idea of Circle World Arts. We held a world arts workshops. We, we moved back here. We worked with Disney World Imagineering, with TED. Uh, we had a residency there. We worked with the Kennedy Center. And lately in 2020, early 2020, we announced our partnership with LAU New York, where we were hosting a number of wonderful workshops over there. Uh, I think we did, we announced four, but we were able to do three because by the fourth one, Corona has started. And uh, we had to, uh, to shift our, our efforts into the digital world. And we did that very quickly. And we did it also thanks to Nadim's support and to LAU um, they, they jumped quickly on supporting us and we, uh, we moved everything online. And since April, we have been doing a workshop every other day that explores the tradition of the artist, the creative journey of the artist, some of the craft that the artists have collected through, through their work. And I have a number of people here who have joined um, our our workshops as teachers like Hadi Tabal, like Firas Zre, also who's a Palestinian kanun player um, based now in New York City. So that was a very, very cool thing to do. We helped uh, generate income for these artists. We did more than 70 workshops. We had over a thousand participants from all over the world and we plan on continuing to do this. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so I am going to tell you in two minutes my New York story, which is I came here as a boring administrator in a university, nothing to do with the arts and nothing to do with music or the theater and all that, except as a, as a part of the audience. And it's, I was startled to see that everyone I met was somehow trying to get into the into that business so we have arabic teachers at lau they're teaching arabic to pay the rent but they're really poets and art and musicians and writers <laughs> and uh, even our my, my colleagues uh, are were in the theater or uh, um, i mean ed china is a concert pianist and so this is what I found fascinating about New York, and you meet people in restaurants, in Ubers, <laughs> everybody's trying to make it, and that fascinated me how, do you, how everyone has a story on, on that. And I can see so many people here that I want to hear from. Uh, maybe, uh, shall, we, shall we start with Firas? Firas, tell us. Uh, Yes, hello everyone. I'm Feras. Nice meeting you all. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, and uh, just raise your hand in the chat. I have to raise your hand somewhere. Oh, yeah. Uh, how do we do that? Not you, not you. But, oh, some... <laughs> but... my hand. Awesome. <laughs> all right, everyone. Uh, my name is Feras Reik. I'm a Palestinian musician, composer, and kanun player, and arranger. Uh, my uh, New York story is uh, rather short compared to most of you, but I will elaborate more on that. I, uh, I arrived in the States uh, around six years ago. I came to Boston, uh, specifically to Berkeley College of Music on a presidential scholarship to pursue my uh, educational um, dream of studying music. And I was there for five years. I did two degrees in uh, jazz composition and one in performance. 
and the head you mentioned Simon Shaheen, which I had the privilege of uh, studying with him closely for five years and touring with him uh, around the States. Um, and then I finished recently in December and I moved here around like seven months ago. I did two concerts and then COVID hit. So it's a very um, specific kind of experience, I would say, to, to come to New York as a freelance musician to pursue your uh, career. And then, you know, one of the, <laughs> like one of the um, worst periods of the music industry the past 100 years, you know, erupts. So it's quite a challenge. But uh, like Happy, like most of you, I, I try to adapt quickly into the online format of things and uh, transitions uh, into doing virtual workshops, virtual lessons, sessions from home, broadcasted concerts, and of course, having the time to invest in my music in terms of creative writing and production. Um, I, I think that it's important to preserve our roots, uh, specifically language. I, I think that languages are not just a mean of communication, it's also um, uh, a mean of power, it's a tool. And I think uh, most international artists that we love and we cherish are those who utilize their language and their culture um, as a tool uh, to serve their craftsmanship. So uh, I try to incorporate this in my music, in my art, and specifically for that I studied jazz in Berkeley because I come from a very uh, deep-rooted background of Macan tradition, for instance. Now, if that wasn't the case, I would have easily gotten lost between the musical melting pot at Berkeley College Music in the contemporary music scene. So what I try to do is to preserve the Macan sound with original music while incorporating all the musical traditions that I grew up with, because I believe that the musical identity is not correlated necessarily with the geographical region per se, but it's, it's more about which cultural, uh, music cultures that you were um, exposed to growing up. So I think that I try to incorporate that in my music. So we have like a full identity reflection in my music while preserving my tradition, which is the Arabic Maqam. Thank you. Thank you, Firas. Thank you. Hey, you, you, were, you worked with Catherine, right? I did. Actually, I, um, I met Catherine through uh, a common friend, Pascal Seigneury, who is a writer and co-star on uh, my last two films. And so uh, we developed this lovely relationship and I started doing some readings at the Lark and um, I've known Hattie for quite some time. Uh, but yeah, I uh, just like everybody else, I, I mean, I moved to New York 10 years ago and searched for better opportunities and I too was not in the arts. I have no, uh, you know, there, were, there are no artists in my family. I grew up in the South, in Saida. And so it was a pretty, you know, conservative, uh, we, you know, no artist allowed kind of, you know, arts is this kind of this alien notion and I wasn't even allowed to consider it. And then I had the opportunity to come to New York to do my master's at Columbia um, in psychology. And uh, I was also juggling an, another one, um, another master's at NYU in public relations and um, um, sales. And, um, I, I, I knew I wanted to be in the arts. I, um, I was in the greatest city um, and I, I took an acting class. I, I always wanted to be an actor and I didn't know what it was. And I took an acting class and I realized, okay, this is, um, this is something that I really wanted to do. And I finished my degrees and I started auditioning. And then I realized, uh, like Hattie said, it's not enough to be an actor these days. You know, uh, you are an Arab actor in, in this market, you have to tell your own stories and you have to create your own content and you have to tell them, tell this industry how you want to be represented. And so I, um, I stepped into the directing role and I did my first short uh, called Abroad. And uh, it was about a Lebanese couple living in New York, um, struggling with being Lebanese immigrants, but also struggling um, with the stereotypes Arab actors face in Hollywood and the American film television market. And uh, it was a small film uh, shot with a skeleton crew, but, um, you know, premiered at uh, the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, which is, a, you know, an Oscar qualifying festival. And uh, 
from there toured the world and opened this lovely conversation about representation and what it is to be a Lebanese immigrant uh, or an Arab immigrant. And, um, and that opened some doors for me and paved the way for uh, my recent short, Manara, which was um, more a cultural expose about Lebanon, about Lebanese families. And uh, I wanted to talk about obsession with appearances in Lebanon and, and, and how families deal with that. And it was, uh, you know, there were different layers in the film, mental health, family dynamics. Uh, so really it was about how families care more about what people think of them than how they interact with each other. And that's uh, that really uh, something I dealt with, a lot of people dealt with, and uh, I was very fortunate to have premiered it at the Venice Film Festival last year. And it's still touring, whatever film festival is still happening right now. Um, and yeah, that's uh, pretty much uh, my story, so. Nadim, Nadim. Yes. First of all, Manara is a, an incredibly beautiful film. So thank you. thank you for that. And you're a wonderful actor. You, thank you. Zane also appears in the film and it's, it's really beautifully done. And I really look forward to our presenting Manara at LAU New York. I think that would be a wonderful place to screen the film, inshallah, very soon. Thank you, yes, I'm excited about Nadim, it. Nadim, can I, I see that Pia Haddad is here and I would love to hear from her. Can, Pia, are you there? You're on mute, sweetheart. Yeah, yeah unmute yourself. Yeah. Is that unmuted? Yes, so, okay. so Pia, Pia, yeah, I was struck by hearing um, uh, stories about um, people uh, who, uh, artists coming from Lebanon and other places who are teaching Arabic in New York to pay the rent and, and you know, but they're artists and they're, you know, they, they're looking to work in the theater or in the arts in some way. And it reminded me also of you because it has, it's part of your story, but uh, because you teach French and you are trilingual, like uh, most of family. And um, so could you just talk a little bit about your trajectory coming here and, um, you know, your journey from Lebanon to New York, which is a pretty interesting one. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, so I am Lebanese, of course, uh, but like a lot of Lebanese, I have a very mixed background. So I was actually born in Norfolk, Virginia, out of all places, go figure. <laughs> but um, I grew up a bit all over, a bit in Canada, France, and then I moved back to Lebanon uh, during my teenage years. Um, and like a lot of Lebanese also, I went on to become, to study management and be in the corporate world <laughs> first. Um, and then, but then the bug hit and then I couldn't deny it. Um, being a citizen, um, you know, who doesn't want to live in New York? So uh, I took the leap and then I went to study acting at the Atlantic Acting School in New York. So my journey started uh, in the arts as an actor. And um, after studying, you know, trying to get roles, et cetera, I was a very frustrated actor, not only because of the, um, you know, how tough it is, but also the opportunities, you know, being the wife of the terrorist or the, you know, all the very stereotypical role. So that what, that's what led me to producing. I was very frustrated. I realized that the stories that I was seeing were not the ones that I knew uh, and that I wanted to see and that represented my culture uh, or other cultures for that matter. The perspective were very biased. So that led me to producing and started my uh, production company. Um, and then I realized that Producing, I had a bit more of a voice and I, I, I mean, I guess I had more of a calling for producing than acting. So I kind of switched to become a creative producer. Um, so that's what led me to New York as a producer. And I've been producing for my own, but freelancing as well. Um, I was um, lucky to be uh, named TCG Rising Leader of Color. And I'm also with Catherine on this too, and Malik on the steering committee. Uh, of um, the MENA Theater Makers Alliance. So I'm very fortunate. And Catherine, you've been instrumental in opening me up to uh, a lot of, to this world really and connecting. That's what you do really well. And so I'm very grateful to you as well. 
Well, just to say that I remember the moment that we met and it was at the LARP and you made such a deep impression on me that I said, I'm going to be friends with this woman and we're going to work together. Halas. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Hey guys, I, I would like to ask a question because I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and they're, you know, I'm seeing Pia, I'm seeing Dina Shahabi and um, uh, Zane who just spoke, hi Zane. And then I'm really struck by something that Firas said about the difference between the uh, musical music identity and cultural identity, which I find fascinating. As someone who was studying at Berkeley and I hope I'm not butchering your point for us and realizing that by being here, there is, there is, that you might have realized or that there is some kind of difference in, in, in what musical culture, culture is and what like cultural identity is. And I am very interested in that. And I would like to ask Pia, Zane, Firas, Dina, if, um, if you feel that tension sometimes between the, um, uh, you know, the, let's say, if first of all, if you believe there is something that is an artistic identity different from say a cultural identity, and if there's a tension between them, and I'll elaborate, what I mean by that is sometimes I feel very proud to be, to have a space uh, and a voice as part of the Middle Eastern community, but sometimes I feel a big tension in being that because I feel like I don't know if I'm actually being seen as a person because I feel like I'm always funneling through the Middle Eastern uh, uh, banner. And so uh, on one hand, I, I'm exhilarated by the, the community and the unity of, of that. And on the other hand, I'm a little bit, uh, I have kind of a reaction to it because I feel like, um, because I do not want to write about how I grew up in the war. I do not want to write about how, I don't want, I don't want to have a voice only because that's the voice you want to see from me. I want to have the voice that I want to give you, not the one that you want because I'm Middle Eastern. And that comes with a power dynamic that we cannot work outside of. So I'm very interested in how you kind of, if this is making any sense to anyone, how you've put together this tension between your individual uh, kind of identity as an artist, which has its cultural identity in it, and between functioning in a community that is striving to actually have a voice. Hadi, can I make one suggestion? If you yes. Okay, I think Dina is on. Dina Shahab is on. Yeah, I mentioned her. Yeah, yeah. She may have to leave. Yeah, but she may have to leave, so maybe she can talk first. Sure. Way to put me on the spot, Catherine. <laughs> That's what I do best. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Dina. Hi, Hadi. Hi, Zane. I know a few people too. Deem. Um, That's such a good question. Um, I, I guess I'll. The first thing that came to mind is, yeah, I feel that. I've felt that from the get-go. I was saying the other day how I was born in Saudi, I was raised in Dubai and Beirut, and I never thought about my identity growing up. And then I came to America, I went to acting school, and immediately it was like, you're Arab, you're Muslim. Like It was like America was giving me this identity that I didn't really have a, a relationship with. I just felt like a person. And then um, at, when I first got out of grad school and I was auditioning, I had this sort of chip on my shoulder about it of, I don't wanna play just the, you know, terrorist wife or the this or the that. And then you sort of realize like, all right, everyone has a way in to this industry and that's my way in. And I'm, I'm stopping myself before I even get started. And so, this is a bit controversial to say, but I'm just being brutally honest. There's a little bit of a game you have to play where you have to look at what the opportunities are there and what, and if there is a really, if there is a space for you to bring your heart and your whole self and it doesn't completely kill your soul, um, there is an opportunity to do it, do your best and then leverage that in order to have more power by people knowing who you are and knowing your work and I have found that um it that does happen after a certain amount of time people start to see you as an actor and I think everyone has said this already but if you're writing your own stories that's just I think everyone should be doing right now I think that's the way that's the new 
way to be an artist. There's so much space for telling your own stories. People are so hungry and in need of um, nuanced stories from anyone. And so what Zane said about like telling the industry who you are, it's, it's that, but it's also just like doing what you want. You have like complete agency to do what you want. Um, so I hope that makes sense. I, it's like a two pronged approach in my opinion, which is like, just do what you want. But also if you do want to leg up in this industry and there are a certain amount of opportunities, don't hold yourself back and get into this whole, e don't let your ego get in the way of an opportunity where you can actually offer something to. And not every role has, has the space for you to bring something to. Some are just garbage and aren't deserving to be on TV, but there are those roles out there that, you know, something came up recently and I, you know, I actually got a lot of acclaim playing a terrorist wife. So I'm saying this with like personal, um, obviously bias, but um, something since then, I also kind of had a new chip on my shoulder. I was like, all right, I've done it. I did it to the best of my ability. I'm fucking done. I don't want to do that again. Um, and then all these other opportunities came out of women, you know, in hijab. And I realized that that there are good roles out there in avenues that might at first glance seem like, oh, this is a stereotype because every Arab woman's in a hijab now and every there's only this one idea of what a Muslim woman is, what an Arab woman is. But actually, if you just keep an open mind, some roles come along that are actually nuanced um, and they're few and far between, but it's just, I'm just trying to say from experience, like I've made the mistake of like a blanket statement of no role that looks like this. And then I would, I'd miss out on roles that were actually unique and special that might look like that at first glance. But then when you read the script and you see the filmmakers behind it and you see that there are actually Arab Muslim voices in the writer's room and writing it, um, you realize, oh wait, maybe this is different. You know, it's almost like I had PTSD <laughs> going in or um, so. It's just important to keep an open mind and open heart and not make sure you're not getting in your own way while also having integrity. I hope that Dina, answers. Th absolutely. Thank you so much for saying all this. And uh, I'm in a similar boat like you and I've been on TV and, you know, and I said, I'm in an, I'm in an, I wasn't an arguably, not very arguably really kind of a tokenized Muslim role. And so, you know, but you kind of have to find out what your fight is and how you get in and then how you can expand on that in order to actually gain power and clout. I want to elaborate my question, given what Dina said to something more on that, which is, do you feel, as any one of you, Pia, Zane, feel, um, or if you ask again, if you want to speak, feel any tension or hadi a little bit from within the Middle Eastern community, which is why I want to be a little bit even more controversial in my question, in the sense that, for example, I, I sometimes feel like I, let's say I want to write a show about aliens, okay? And right. maybe as a, Middle Eastern, as a Middle Eastern writer, I feel like sometimes, wait, no. As a Middle Eastern writer, what I have to participate in right now is writing something that has to do with like how the Middle Eastern story is perceived or not in our world. And I feel like maybe I, it's not my place to write about aliens or about FBI agents or something, to write something bigger. And sometimes I feel like, okay, maybe I shouldn't because, hey, why would I waste my time when I can give the, 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 our community a voice? But then sometimes I was like, but what if I want to write about aliens, okay? I want to write about aliens. And somehow I, think, I feel like, I as, you know what I mean? Own, yeah, I think, I actually think you're getting in your own way and you can do what you want. And the pressure, like there's enough people telling stories about Middle Eastern, the Middle Eastern right. experience. But also if people want to do that, great. If you want to write about aliens, great. There's no reason we yeah. should have these, you know, ways of holding each other back or holding ourselves back. Honestly, this is a time to do what you want. Content exactly. is needed. There's space to be who you are. Alien shows are great. Like, do everything. <laughs> so it made me think. I remember doing this panel where, and I'll stop talking forever, but I remember doing this panel where people were like, if you're not Lebanese, you're not allowed to audition for a Lebanese character. If you're not Saudi, you're not. And I was like, yeah. this is so problematic. Like yeah. that is put it, that is like limiting ourselves and it comes from that scarcity mentality. So I just think any pressure that you're feeling from anyone, they're just not the right people and don't hold right, yourself yeah. back. Can I uh, just I really want to welcome Lina Abiyad? I can see her name. She's my colleague from LAU. 
Hi, hi, Nadim. How are you? Catherine, did you see that? She said, yeah. Yes, Zane, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to completely agree. I think um, we, I, I just recently had a conversation with the producer because I was trying to pitch an idea of a, of a show that I'm writing. And uh, they're about Lebanese immigrants here making very questionable choices. And she said, no, um, already Muslims have a bad rep. I think I, this is not something I, I, I want to be part of. And I, that took me, that, that kind of took me by surprise. And I'm thinking, uh, I'm not here to, you know, I'm, I'm writing about humans. I'm writing about people making choices based on circumstances that they're surrounded with. I'm not here to perpetuate stereotypes. And we had this long conversation about being a responsible Arab or a responsible Muslim trying to portray the best image given the demonization that's happening around the world. And I think we should just tell the stories that we want to tell and um, without trying to fulfill anyone's expectations of who we are. And I think the humanity will find a way to come through. And when I, when I first started auditioning, I, I would go in and my resume would say language skills, Arabic. And then they would look at me, they would do this with their head and they're like, we just don't know where to place you. And I heard that so many times. And then I was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll do my own thing. And I'll tell you where to place me. And then I, I, I did this film about two regular people going through regular stuff. And everybody was like, oh, so you people go through the same issues we go through. And I'm saying, well, yes, we all worry about money. We all worry about paying the bills and we all worry about success and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's our own way of executing a story in a universal way that I think might pave the way for change so but if it makes you all feel better i had the same experience studying economics you know i was i was looking at you know, economics in the 1930s with nothing to do with the middle east and everybody would, would ask me what's this got to do with the middle east you know <laughs> and they, they, they wanted to, to to find a but there are some of us who have gone also beyond like i mean i can see i mean hashem scratching his beard keep on i mean hi nadim thank you for having me also i mean you you do regular stuff yeah um, hi everybody <laughs> my name is amin hashem and i'm a lebanese american singer opera singer tenor um, and also I perform crossover music as well and I've dabbled in a little bit of acting here and there um, so what, what was your what was your question basically um, uh, is the, do you mean like if I if have I uh, suffered from my racial background when it comes to, to, to music um, can you hear me no, is, not, is, that, not, is that question for me or for Nadine? No, uh, I mean, it was just an excuse to, to, to hear your voice and tell us your New York story. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I was born and raised in, in Beirut and um, I started studying music at the age of five under my father's uh, tutelage, basically. And uh, music has always been my passion and I I never thought that I would actually do like do something else, anything else for that matter. And um, I started my career at a, at a very young age. I, um, I was a pianist at first and uh, singing to me was always more than just a passion. I always identified myself as a singer. Um, started in nightclubs in Lebanon and opera has, was always my biggest uh, passion. So I introduced opera music in nightclubs and this was really uh, new and sometimes jarring for people, but, uh, but it gained traction eventually. And uh, New York was always my preferred, my preferred city as, uh, as, as everybody, you know, all of you, like I heard Pia say the same thing and I've heard Hadi talk about New York and their passion towards New York. I always knew that I would end up in New York, but because I sang both opera and crossover music, crossover is like the bridge between classical music and popular music. So, um, like I, I sang rock and roll, I sang pop music, rock, 
but opera has always been my my heart and soul. So I decided before going to New York, I wanted to go to Europe first to study, uh, to seek out the truth. And I did that in, in Italy, Germany, and France. Um, I got my degree from there. Uh, before that, I went to Notre Dame University uh, in Lebanon and studied international business and economics because I always loved to be, I always loved uh, these subjects, but, but like I said, my heart and soul were, 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 were not there. So after starting a career in Lebanon, I went to Europe, continued my studies there and started singing operatic roles uh, between Germany, Italy, and sometimes France. And um, I was invited by a lot of people to perform in Dubai, which was very interesting to me because I didn't know that a lot of people in Dubai loved that kind of music. Eventually in 2010, I wanted to master my craft. And I knew that the best training was in New York. So I did my US tour. I, I had a show in Vegas, California and Chicago and decided to just drop by New York and uh, meet some, a lot of opera singer uh, mentors. And I found a great guy who passed away last year. His name was Francisco Casanova. And um, I auditioned for him and I was very sick. I just, it, was, it, it was truly a terrible audition, but he heard something and he said, it was worth wasting my time on you. I told him, I would love to study with, start studying with you now, uh, but can I, uh, can I honor my commitments in Lebanon? Because I had a lot of contracts between Lebanon and Europe. He was like, do your thing and come back. So I returned to New York in November, 2011. So come November 15, it'll be my ninth anniversary in New York. And, and I studied with him for about three years and a half and uh, started singing roles. Went, I've done Kennedy Center, I've done, uh, a Carnegie Hall. I've uh, done many small houses in the US and decided just to reboot my career from there. And eventually I came to a point in my life where I had to fight my demons, like, uh, so to speak. So I was like, I love opera, but I also, I've performed a lot of pop music and crossover music. And how can I, how can I stand out? I just, cause it's, you know, when you have certain demons to fight, it's always hard because you're never fully satisfied. So I decided to um, knock on a PR publicist's door. His name is, uh, is Keith Sherman, and he's a big Broadway publicist. Um, eventually, he's like, well, what do you, do you have, do you have, do you have your own show? I said, yes, I lied. I didn't have a show. And do you have, can you fill up the house? Um said, Yes, I also lied. So he's like, all right, let me make a call. So he called the booking agent, the 54 Below. I don't know if you're guys familiar with that venue. It's like a premier Broadway uh, venue. Um, he spoke to her, he's like, I have a wonderful guy and he, he can fill the house and he has a show, he's ready. I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this. So I spoke to her and she's like, can you perform next month? And she just gave me a date. And I'm like, all right, now the thing is real. So I, I couldn't tell you what I was feeling. I was so happy, but at the same time I was exhausted and I was like, it was a truly a mental, uh, I was about to have a mental breakdown, but you know what? I just knocked, I, I spoke to my music director then, Brian Holman, and we decided to go to every venue, every jazz venue and Broadway venue in New York we recruited musicians, we set up a show, and uh, I just reached out to a lot of people. And thankfully, I was beautifully surprised by our previous uh, Consul General, Mejdi Ramadan, who was a, truly a big support to me. And he reached out to a lot, of, a lot of Lebanese people. And as soon as they posted my show at 54 Below, it was bombarded by Lebanese people. So which was, which was a blessing, truly. And uh, the show was such a success. I, I got beautiful uh, responses from critics from Broadway World, and they said that I combined operatic music with new sounds. So I decided to dig deeper and uh, to dig deeper as you guys were doing, like, you know, the roots, basically. And 
I started creating, a, infusing like Middle Eastern sounds with opera and pop music. And eventually my brother and I, who couldn't be with us now, Andrew, uh, who has work now with uh, CBS, unfortunately, um, but he really wanted to meet all of you, maybe someday when COVID is over. Uh, we did together a concept and um, it was basically a music video. We went to Lebanon and shot the concept all over Lebanon from coast to coast. And the song was called Abbalati Abbalati, which means dance. And it's in the Sicilian dialect. And we included, incorporated Middle Eastern sounds, tabli, nai, uh, enun. And um, this was basically the music that we grew up with, the folk Italian, folk Lebanese. And we, the, the concept of the music video was very basic. Um, we wanted to show how beautiful Lebanon is, how great the Lebanese people are, and that Lebanon has, is a melting pot uh, in, in the Middle East. And thankfully, uh, we won the Best Music Video Award at the New York Film Festival in 2019. And I think, you know, since then, I've, uh, the demons have been fought successfully. And I've been jumping from like an operatic role to a crossover show to just using my cultural heritage uh, as, a, as a means to define who I am as a, as a musician, as a human being. And I didn't intend on that to be like my mission uh, per se, but, but, but at the same time, it, it, just, it just happened. Sometimes life, I think, takes you into directions that you like you know you don't necessarily want but but when you I think adopt these or let's just say adapt you can be good at it so and it, I mean, I'm sorry in a nutshell this is my story I <laughs> you caught me off guard and but, but, I, but what you what you've been saying is very relevant also to a uh, I hope you're all looking at the chat because there's been, been a conversation between Dima Matar and, but she's gone, and Sara Bitar. So Sara, tell us what it's about. <laughs> tell us what it's about. Marhaba. Um, oh, so great to be here. Um, when I was in high school and I would like read about like, uh, philosophical circles or whatever, like with Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and whatnot. And now like, you know, learning, I mean, uh, um, learning in depth about al Rabit al-Kolamiya after the beautiful introduction that Michael has given. Uh, I'm like, uh, I feel uh, <laughs> um, uh, happy to be part of this um, uh, group of people. Uh, it's fun to be, to feel like we're part of a community of, of artists or writers or, you know, and that we come together to think about these big questions and about our identities and the art that we create. Um, I know many of you actually, so hi to the people that I, um, I already know, Hedy, um, <laughs> Zen, anyway. Um, um, uh, pop, pop, pop. I'm not sure where to start. Um, um, can, can I can I ask you something so that you can tell us this way you can guide where to start? Because I want to bring two or three things together, if you don't mind, Nadine. Uh, we want to hear from Sarah if you can talk about the challenges that you face when you first kind of want to, you know, because this is about the Rabita 2020 or 1920. Mm -hmm. What are, I mean, there are, uh, uh, there are, there are technical challenges that have to do with papers, say, and being able to work, which a lot of times we don't talk about because we assume everyone else can work. You know, I had to go through these. It took me 10 years to get a green card. So I don't know if you can speak to technical obstacles, if you can speak to, say, artistic obstacles, like you're the kind of, let's say you come from Lebanon and you are weird kind of in a certain way of doing art, and then suddenly the market here is very different, so how do you marry that? 
and maybe there are cultural differences, which is basically what we are talking about. And the reason why I, I'm, I'm shaping it this way, if you may, if, if you if, if you can talk about it in that manner, is because I want to link it again to a question that came from Dima Metta on the chat, who is a Lebanese artist, yeah. and I want us to veer towards her eventually to talk about what. To, to address her question, which we can, Catherine, if you might want to like lead that after Sarah goes so that we can make sure that we're giving her time. Sure. Thank you so much, Heidi, for directing this. And uh, I, I love Dima. So hi, Dima. Um, so first of all, to put my, my story into context, so I came to the US four years ago, I got accepted into the STEM Adler Studio of Acting. Um, so I did my training there for three years and I only graduated like about a year and a half ago. So I've been um, out there for only a year and a half. I'm currently um, transferring from my OPT to my alien of extraordinary ability status. Um, so um, I'm, I'm literally in a, in a purgatory zone at the moment, not knowing what's going to happen for me in the next two months, whether I'm going to have to go back to Beirut. And by the way, um, I hope that all of your families and friends are safe. And um, if they're not, I don't know what to say. It's been heartbreaking to experience this um, tragedy, uh, still finding uh, my thoughts or feels about it. I mean, yeah, um, I don't know about you, but I've been quite grieving for the past, um, since October, since August 4th. And um, yeah, and it's gonna be about um, two weeks uh, until like the anniversary of the, of our revolution. Um, so yeah, they're, they're also, I feel that I can't talk about my journey without mentioning these um, events that have been very uh, uh, important in shaping my Id identity in the past year. Um, so um, in terms of, so these are some of the technical obstacles that I've faced that in response to your question, Hattie, uh, as far as art, I, uh, after graduated, uh, graduating, I created a theater company with friends. So we were doing our own project. I wrote a 10 minute play uh, about um, with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera as the protagonists to talk about um, uh, like immigration and creating art uh, from afar. And it, it, um, it performed uh, in February at a little black box theater in Astoria and then the play ends with why am I talking about like the revolution and immigration you know and like whatever's happening at the borders through the voices of like Frida who is a big role model for me but why is it hard to talk about my Lebanese identity to uh, an American audience and I start addressing so basically I, I break the fourth wall and I start talking to the audience to to ask questions uh, about like why is it hard for me to why am I intimidated to talk to speak in Arabic to to say the word revolution <laughs> to an American audience and um, and um, and why am I kind of like I don't know, hiding behind a, a Hispanic, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, identity. I don't know. I, so I did that. So for the past year, I feel like I've been writing a lot. Um, and and I created a, a, a short film that got shown at, the, at a benefit for Lebanon last week and that will be shown again next week at uh, the virtual uh, festival um, organized by the MENA Theatre Makers Alliance, um, where I will be speaking uh, at a panel with Leila Buck and uh, Muna Mansour. Woo! Like, um, so, um, yeah, I feel um, I'm, in a, I'm in a place where I'm, I, I feel like, I'm starting to get to know um, 
how to express myself in this country. I'm talking to you from Brooklyn or the unceded territory of the Mansi, Lenape, and the Canarsi people. Um, and um, so, yeah, I feel like I'm kind of new to the game that um, we were that. talking about earlier. Sorry. Oh, I'm just saying thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, but um, um, I feel that these are very valid questions. I was talking, uh, I was on a film set this weekend and I was talking to a friend who was doing, uh, um, who was recording refugee stories in Jordan. And I was, I was asking him, like similar to the questions that we were asking, like, how do we, like how do i i'm not sure like how to how to talk about for example the beirut experience at the moment without being looked at as a like victim in a way even if like it's a it's a heavy and dark story but at the same time i don't want to like yeah i don't want to be put in the context of like oh Oh, she's from the Middle East, and oh, I mean, like, I don't know. Maybe she's she she's supposed to be used to this by now, or it's just like what it's like whatever happens in the Middle East. So for me, at the moment, a very important question as well is like, how do we tell these stories that do shape our identity in a in a way that doesn't put us in a in a in a vulnerable in a vulnerable state or that doesn't exoticize us or like because i want to express that because like but so yeah it's like um i don't know if i'm thank you yeah okay. how do you one more, because we're running out of time there's one more article from new york which is very very important i mean this subject is so fascinating but I want to go to one more, which is New York as the springboard. People come to New York and then they go to California and they go to Hollywood and they go to everywhere else. And so I want to uh, ask Doris to tell me about this. Doris Bitar. Hi, thank you. Uh, I, I might be the only visual artist here. I'm not sure, but uh, those are my roots from New York from um, the uh, high school. We immigrated when I was a child and uh, I always thought I'd do art because it was the only thing I was good, good at, it seemed. It was from this sort of accidental, well, I'm good at that, so. Um, as a young adult, uh, and I, I graduated from uh, State University of New York at Purchase, as a young adult, though I accidentally, I mean, almost everything that's happened to me is accidental. So I accidentally became a, a labor organizer for about five years. I was completely engrossed. And so I've been an activist my entire adult life. And Hattie, I know you didn't mean alien in this way, but now I'm a president of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee in San Diego and an organizer for the national. And literally, when I go to meetings, just to break the ice, I go like this. I come in peace. <laughs> I, watch, I watch Star Trek so that I could like strategize about identity. And you know, the, the latest Star Trek is really good that way. And I was watching it like totally engrossed and it starts up again at the end of this month. And I can't wait because it's helped me strategize how the community moves forward. What are the kinds of conversations we have to have? So that's me on the one hand, and I try to shake it off. I've had children, I, I teach at a local university, which I'm also suing because they discriminated against me. I'm in the middle of a lot of things. My own artwork is completely engrossed in the idea of pattern and Middle Eastern pattern, but as structure. And honestly, I'm here because I would love to work with any of you on stage sets. <laughs> and I make musical instruments out of pattern. I call those performing patterns. You can go to my website and check it out. These little private, and sometimes not so private. I'm working with Arab Amp with Leia Tawil to create new sounds. So I always kept them separate. You know, my, my, my geeky art stuff and my activism are separate. 
sometimes, like everything it seems in my life, they accidentally overlap. And that's always a wonderful time. I think though, if I were not an Arab, I probably would be a minimalist artist, interested in architecture and spaces. And uh, so I do it through pattern. And our pattern, thankfully, is anchored in diversity, the diversity around from the whole world. And that's how what we call Arab culture and art was created, whether it's music, the harmonic scale, it came from many other parts, Byzantium, China, Africa, Gypsy, to create these new patterns in music and in sight. And uh, I think our role as Arab Americans is to continue to do that. I think aside from being terrorists or whatever people think about us, that that is the talent we bring from our home country to the United States. I also wanna say something about New York. I, I think of myself a New Yorker, but I, I live in San Diego and I've been here for 30 some odd years with occasional stays in New York and my family's in New York and my husband's family's in New York. So we're always going there. But New York is also a receptacle. And I don't say that to put it down, but a lot of things do not spring forth from New York. They spring forth from somewhere else. And I wanna give just one example. And things do spring forth from New York. So this one example, um, the Occupy movement, for example, the Occupy Wall Street became very significant. I mean, that seemed to be very New York, but its origins were Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, just before the Arab Spring, Egyptians sent blankets to the Americans in Wisconsin who were occupying the state capital. This is where it began. It took a few months before they did Occupy Wall Street, and that made lots of sense. Of course it should be in Wall Street, but that's not where it began. And so as a pattern and decoration artist, those are my roots. That began in San Diego, right here where I live. The, the critic and CalArts, the critics, the artists, all of them. And then it went to New York and it was this new thing in 1975, pattern and decoration movement. So that, those are examples. The other thing is Gulf Labor, of which I'm a member and an original uh, part of, which didn't like, and this is my union stuff coming back to haunt me. Uh, we didn't like what was going on to the workers, you know, the Guggenheim building in Abu Dhabi, and we organized to say, well, let, let's at least help these workers. Uh, so pay, for example, the, the debt so they can begin working not in debt. And uh, that went on for several years. It still goes on. We're still in touch with them. But that was really started by Walid Ra'ad, a visual artist from Lebanon, from the South. I'm from the South, too. When you said Saida, somebody said Saida. <laughs> I'm, from the, I'm from the mountain hick part east of Saida. So I'm not going to speak Arabic because I sound very unsophisticated. But because uh, I speak a circa 1965 hick Arabic. Anyway, so I'm not, my relatives in New York, in, in Beirut tell me, don't talk Arabic. So anyway, um, what, what I want to say is Walid uh, could not have started Gulf labor without the Arab Spring, which may not have started without Occupy and the kind of exchanges that were going back and forth across the Atlantic. And um, Gulf labor made big inroads. You know, it also hurt our careers, honestly. We were hurt by it. And um, many of the artists in Gulf labor were already talking through environmental discussions about what was New York like, you know, a thousand years ago, environmentally. It's Broadway is a spine in New York that the native Americans traveled. It's an ancient, ancient road. That's why Broadway angles, because it's a high spot in Manhattan. And that connected to decolonize, you know, respecting the people who came before us. And Arab artists were at the forefront of this. Many of them were part of Gulf labor. And so I just wanted to share that a little bit as a kind of recent New York story. We hear about decolonize, we hear about Occupy, and there's a real relationship between those. And in fact, it was Arab, Lebanese, Palestinian, several other sorts of artists that, that created that. So, you know, I still want to go to New York and I, my husband's going to retire soon. I think we're going to spend the fire months 
in New York, like right now, you know, September, October, November, we're going to be in New York. <laughs> it's our future because <laughs> we want to avoid the California fires, which today is a bad day too. Anyway, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that. Thank you. Hadi, I saw you, you raised your, your hand. No, was it before, was it long ago? So we're coming to, we, we've, we've gone way, way over time uh, and we can go on forever, but I think we need to, to wrap, wrap, it, wrap it up. Uh, it, there is a very interesting conversation happening on chat. I hope you've been following it with, with Dima Matta um, about, again, about this identity business and you know, there was a student at Berkeley that I met in Boston who was very, very happy with very Greek nationalist in, and wanting to show Greek nationalist music. He gave us a concert. I don't know if you're asking me, you may have met him. And when he came, he played, he played the music that we think is Arab. So <laughs> he played Uskudar and he played something similar to Qudut uh, Halabiya uh, uh, and, and so, so the, there's, an, there's another aspect of identity, which is that uh, we've, we've appropriated all these things, but they are universal and they are a mixture of everything from uh, probably from ancient Syriac to, 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 to the Far East. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I hope one day we will continue this physically in New York with proper drinks and proper chats with all of you. And um, Firas is saying, where can we find the recording? OK, so there will it will be uh, on uh, Albert, who, uh, without whom nothing would have happened is uh, going to post it on our Facebook page. It's been also broadcast live on the Facebook page. So the, this will be on our YouTube channel and, and the Facebook page. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming. <laughs> thank you, Nadim. Thank you, Nadim. Thank you, thank you, thank you for organizing thank this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.